welcome to Lake with this morning. We're so glad that you guys have all been able to join us from wherever you are today. And we would just ask that you guys would stand up and start off by joining us with singing together as a community. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me.
my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as Good morning, Lakewood, and welcome to Church Online today. For those of you who don't know, my name is Pastor Dave Dreger, and I am the lead pastor here at Lakewood. Now, I just want to let you know, today is a communion Sunday, and so if you'd like to get some bread and something to drink, it doesn't have to be juice, uh, but just have that prepared, because we'll be having communion in just a few minutes together. Now, if you are new to this online experience, if you've just tuned in for the first time with us here at Lakewood, uh, we'd love to let you to let us know that you were here. And so if you want to click on the I'm new here uh, button, that would be great. It'll take you to a, a page on our website where you can fill in a short contact form. There's also a guest experience survey there if you'd like to fill that out. But we just want to have some information so we can contact you with just a single email just to let you know of a next step you can take if you would like to be more connected with us here at Lakewood. Just a couple updates for things that are going on with all the changes with online church. You'll notice today that there's no lyrics printed in the handout for you, but we do have them on the screen, just so that you don't have to be clicking over to a separate document during the worship time. You can just stay tuned in right with the worship team. Also want to let you know that we are working currently with our life groups to get our life groups online. So if you are connected with a life group currently or would like to be, we're working to get as many of those online using Zoom as possible. We had our ladies group meet yesterday online. We have a Monday night group meeting tomorrow night online, and we're excited to be able to see how this platform works out as people stay connected. Also want to let you know of a new way that you can do giving to the church. And we realize this is a challenging time and that might be more difficult for you right now, but we had some people asking about a way to give that wouldn't have so many fees associated with it for the church. 
So this week we set up an e-transfer method, which you can access by clicking the giving button on your screen, which will take you to the giving page on our website. On there you'll see that the email to send an e-transfer to is giving at lakewoodalliance.com. If your bank is set up for auto deposit, you don't even need to enter a security question when you do the e-transfer. It'll just go directly into our bank account. Otherwise, if you do need to put a security question in, please send an email also to giving at lakewoodalliance.com to let us know what password you've chosen so that we're able to access that and deposit it. Also want to let you know about office hours that are happening at the church. Uh, we want to maintain social distancing and make sure things stay safe and clean everything as you come and go. But we do have the office open daily from 11.30 to 1 during the week uh, to allow for people, if you need to come and drop off a receipt for a ministry expense, such as soup bus or other things that are still going on, or if you would like to do a donation via the debit machine or drop off a check. Either one of those ways, if you want to stop by, that's fine. Not for visits, uh, not for appointments. We're still going to do all of those virtually online. But if you do have one of those other reasons to stop by, please feel free to do that during those hours. Also want to mention uh, that you should have received from me a little weekly email update uh, that had a video message from me. Lots of videos going on these days. Uh, on Friday. And if you did not receive that, that's because we do not have an email address for you. If you would like to be receiving those updates, feel free to go to lakewoodalliance.com or click on the website button and then you can go down to the bottom of the page and there's a subscribe to our newsletter part there where you can just put your email in and then we'll have that contact information to be sending out these weekly updates to you. All right, a couple uh, upcoming events that we have going on that we wanted to mention because, you know, with all the changes and things going on, it's a little harder to do some of the things we normally do, but we are still working to be able to do some events together as a church. First one I wanted to mention is the Stations of the Cross. We've been doing this the last number of years. We're going to continue it this year in a different fashion. So rather than coming to the church and walking through the Stations of the Cross in the sanctuary, we want to invite you to go onto the site, website, and we're going to have there a book that you can print or a mobile edition you can follow along on your phone. And then you'll be able to drive around town to different locations and walk through reflections on the cross of Jesus. Or if you're not able to drive around, you can just follow along in the booklet at home, uh, in the comfort of your own home with some of the pictures that we'll have in there for you and the reflections. We just wanted to give you an opportunity still on Good Friday to spend some time reflecting on the significance of the cross of Jesus. Now the other event coming up, I want to let Pastor Don tell you a bit about, is a fun thing that's happening this Wednesday night. Hi everyone, in case you didn't know, my name is Don Isaac and I'm the Children and Youth Pastor here. Um, I decided that we should do something fun as a group. And because most of my kids in junior youth group and senior youth group are not driving yet, it's going to be a family event because we need to have everybody come together. So this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, show up in the church parking lot, stay in your cars, social distancing, we don't want to do that, and don't bring your friends, do it as a family. Uh, when you get here, you're going to text my number, 250-961-9791, uh, and I will send you a list of things you want to go around the city, taking pictures of you and your team together out there. When you have done the list, uh, the cutoff time will be at 8.30, and you can pick your five top pictures that you like and load them up on Instagram with the hashtag, hashtag Rooted Lakewood Youth. When you get those on your five pictures, we will go through them. I'll pick the five that are the best out of everybody, and then I will go live and hand out prizes. So sort of a together thing, but not together at all, but a chance to kind of hang out and have some fun this week. So be here at the church Wednesday night at 7 uh, with my telephone number is important, 250-961-9791, and we'll get you going on the night. All right, see you on Wednesday. Well, we want to come to the Lord's table now. And so if, I hope you've had a chance to go and get some bread and something to drink as well as we come together to the communion table. We want to celebrate this today, even though in some ways we are apart, but still very much together. In these days, it's really important for us to come back to what actually defines us as individuals and as a community. It's not security in our jobs. It's not security even in our homes or in our family. Rather, we are defined by the fact that we have been made the children of God, disciples of Jesus Christ, a people with Jesus as our head, our leader. 
finding hope and peace in the life that he's made possible through his death on the cross. So as we gather today, we want to remember his great sacrifice for us. And as we prepare to partake of the bread and of the cup, I want to just take a moment to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the words that Paul recorded for the church there about how they should celebrate this meal together. They were having some issues about how they did this, and he recorded some instructions for them that may sound very familiar because we've read these words many times as we come to the Lord's table, but they're so important for us to remember again today. I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So why don't you take the piece of bread that you have there, tear off a piece, or if you'd like to eat the whole thing, go ahead and eat the whole thing. But let's take the bread together and give thanks for Jesus' body that was nailed to the cross for us. Jesus, thank you so much for the sacrifice and for the pain that you endured, the pain of separation from your Father in addition to the physical pain of the cross. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that in your body, nailed to the cross, and in your death, we may have life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So let's eat this bread together, remembering what Jesus has done for us and giving thanks. Paul carries on in 1 Corinthians 11 by saying, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's take a moment and give thanks for the cup of Jesus that made the way for a new covenant, a new agreement between us and God. Jesus, we thank you so much for the cup of your blood poured out so that we could have a new relationship with the Father. Thank you for inviting us into this to become the sons and daughters of God. We receive this today and proclaim again your death on our behalf with thanks. Amen. Let's drink the cup together. great to be together today in this way, to be able to recenter our eyes on the person of Jesus who defines us and who gives us hope. And as we continue on in our service and as Ian opens up the word with us today, I pray that you will continue to be blessed and continue to have your hope renewed and restored. God bless you, church. Good morning. My name is Ian Bennett. I'm an associate pastor here at Lakewood. Uh, with all my heart, I hope you've been keeping safe, uh, doing everything you can to, to minimize the pressure on our health care workers. In other words, being intensely responsible with your actions, but staying connected uh, in prayer um, and uh, together in non-face-to-face -face ways. Through technology, I think God has given us, uh, has, has given the church uh, the grace at this time to be perhaps an even closer community than we were before this outbreak. But if you are not uh, practicing near hospital level hygiene, uh, if your physical distancing does not include everyone other than those who live in your home, uh, grandparents, aunties, uncles must practice physical distancing. If you're not staying at home, except when absolutely necessary, you need to start now. Um, that's, my, uh, that's my message to you. You're simply adding to the problem. Okay, there's my rant for this morning. Uh, let's get into the Word of God. We're in the book of Luke in a series entitled Path of the King. And this morning we're going to unpack Luke chapter 21, verses 5 to 36. And depending on the device you're using to view this morning's service, uh, somewhere on the page you're viewing, uh, above me or below me or somewhere, um, there will be a link to an online Bible. 
Uh, it just says Bible. Uh, if you click on that link, um, the default version is the 2011 NIV. And, but beside that, you'll find a little tab with the book of the Bible. The, the, it's set for G-E-N, Genesis. Uh, if you click on that, a list of the books of the Bible will appear. Scroll down it, find Luke. Uh, that's the book we're in this morning. And go to chapter 21, verse 5. Or you can use one of those old-fashioned devices called a book. Uh, they have pages in them, and you can scroll through those until you find Luke chapter 21. Basically the same principle. Anyhow, Luke chapter 21, beginning with verse 5. And th this is a really relevant portion of Scripture, especially considering where we find ourselves in the world at this time. Jesus and his disciples uh, had just arrived uh, in Jerusalem after making the 25-kilometer the walk from Jericho. Uh, the people of uh, Jerusalem heralded, him, heralded Jesus as the coming Messiah, shouting uh, Hosanna and, and laying palm branches at his feet. Uh, and when Jesus entered the city, he visited the temple, um, created quite a scene there, clearing uh, the temple, knocking over the tables of the money changers, uh, storming around with a, a whip made out of uh, rope, and that event, at the time of our story this morning, that event was now a few days in the past. Uh, things were beginning to settle down a bit. Uh, for several days, Jesus had been quietly teaching in the temple. Now, our text in Luke 21, verse uh, 5, begins with the disciples of Jesus, probably in the exact same mindset that most of us were in back in January and February. Uh, verse 5 reads, some of his disciples were remarking, were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. Uh, in other words, life was pretty normal. Uh, beautiful day, beautiful temple, sunshine and rainbows. You know, my grandkids, who I'm not going to be able to hug for a while sing a song by Rafi called Joshua Giraffe, and the chorus goes, nothing can go wrong, go, I'm in the Congo. But, uh, you know, that was, the, that was the mindset of the disciples on that day in maybe 24 or 25 AD. But Jesus was about to burst their bubble. Uh, in verse 6, he turned to them and said, as for what you see here, looking at the temple, he said, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. In other words, uh, the world as you know it is about to change. History affords us the benefit of hindsight. We now know that the Roman army laid siege to Jerusalem and tore down the walls of the temple and the walls of the city even in 70 A.D., and when Jesus told the disciples that the temple would, would someday be gone, I think the response was fairly predictable. The uh, teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? Now, I wonder what the reaction would have been if Jesus had have said, 45 years, 45 years, and calamity is going to come upon you. You know, in our own century, the great influenza pandemic that shook the world during the, the First World War officially ended in March of 1920. That's just about 100 years to the month. Uh, I wonder what the reaction of people would have been if someone of credibility had said at the time, 100 years. You have 100 years before a similar crisis once again comes upon this earth. Now, Jesus didn't give a number because I, I think he knew that such um, precise predictions were futile. People have terribly short memories. People are in inherent deniers. So instead, Jesus gave his disciples, and, and that includes us, uh, warnings, not just for the end times, but for all times. You see, the things that Jesus uh, said next to his disciples were not just for some future apocalyptic event. They had meaning at the time Jesus spoke them. They've had meaning in all the days between the days of Jesus and now. They have meaning now, and 
If the Lord delays his return, they will have meaning for some time yet to come. So don't be afraid that we're not going to get through this present crisis. We're getting through this. There, there will be losses. Um, more people are going to die. Uh, I took some flack, I think, for saying that online. I, I think there was a bit of a feeling that it was not, not a very pastoral thing to say. Um, I, I need you to know that I'm a, I'm a pastor by title, not by gifting. So I'm, I'm going to tell you, uh, according to my gifting, uh, what I believe is going on right now. I believe the Lord is calling the nations to return to him. This is like the days of Moses when the people of Israel fell into sin and idolatry and Moses stood at the entrance to the camp and shouted, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. This is the time for the church to get on board with what God is doing on this earth. And it may not seem like it, but this is the day of harvest. And it will come to an end. And, you know, when it does, we'll have some rebuilding to do. Um, I think the anti-vaxxers may have to repent. You know, when the vaccine arrives, I'll bet they'll be the first in line going right there. Um, but the day will come when we'll be back to dealing with climate change as the greatest threat to our survival. But let's take a look at some of the things that Jesus uh, said in answer to these questions from his followers. Verse 8, he replied, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. How many Messiah cults have sprung up on this earth since Jesus spoke those words? Well, actually, that's not a rhetorical question. Uh, since the time of Jesus Christ, 59 individuals have claimed Messiah status and have amassed significant numbers of followers in this world. And that's not to mention the thousands and thousands uh, of, of mini messiahs like Inri of Brazil and uh, uh, Vasarian of Russia who are alive right now, um, who have popped up, claimed Messiah status, and they will disappear uh, just as quickly in this world. See, the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. That means he's going to come at any time. But his return is also going to be visible. The world is going to know it's him. Simple rule of thumb in this, if you have to ask, it's not him. When he comes, people will know. The church will know better than any. Uh, there will be a great cheer of victory from those who know him. There will be a way, great wail of dismay from those who don't. But nobody is going to miss it. When the king returns, we'll know it's him. Verse 9 and 10, when you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Now, what do we do with a scripture like this? Um, a lot of people are looking for some kind of a, of a culmination of these events uh, described in this passage in order to discern if, if the return of Jesus Christ is drawing near. But that's not really what Jesus was saying here. He said, these things must happen first. Since the death of Jesus Christ... 367 million people have died in wars on this planet. 253 million people have perished in pandemics, just like the one we're facing right now. 215 million people have died in famines. And those are, are the most conservative of estimates. The real numbers are worse than that. Those are mind-boggling numbers. And uh, they're spread across recorded history from the time of, of Christ until now. But Jesus was saying, this is going to be life on this planet until I return. But do not be frightened. A lot of people teach that the hardest thing Jesus ever said was that we should love our enemies. I don't think so. Uh, I think the hardest thing Jesus ever said was do not be frightened. 
especially when there are really scary things going on. I spent more than half my adult life climbing big peaks. Mountains are beautiful things, but there are moments of terror on mountains. You know, when a rock the size of a Volkswagen is thundering down a draw in your direction, there's a strong temptation to be afraid. You know, when you're standing under a glacier and you hear an exploding crack of an icefall a thousand feet above your head, sometimes you wish you were wearing diapers. But, but you know what I loved about mountain climbing? There are no atheists on mountains. Because often it's a choice between fear or faith. A lot of people think that the opposite of fear is courage. You know, you may very well arrive at courage, but you've got to go through faith to get there. Do not be frightened. Can you hear those words from the heart of our Lord? He holds you in the palm of our hand. He's, he's your loving father, your dad, your, your, your Abba. You're his possession and his treasure. Do not be frightened. Verse 12, but before this, before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. And, and that word synagogues is more, more of a metaphor than a literal term. It refers to those who oppose Christ. But Jesus went on to say, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You know, in the mid-1980s, I've, I've shared this story at the church before. I traveled in mainland China. It was a time when Christianity was being deeply persecuted, uh, and the church had, had been forced underground. And we were visiting one such church when I spied an elderly gentleman sitting by himself a few rows from the front. And I went over to him and I gave him a Bible. And he immediately broke into tears. And I called our translator over and, and the old man told me that he hadn't had a Bible since 1966 when his was taken from him during what they called the Great Proletariat Cultural Revolution in China. He was jailed for 10 years for being a Christian. And worse than that, it was his son who had betrayed him. But God is the great redeemer of impossible situations. When this elderly gentleman asked if I would like to meet the son who betrayed him, uh, you can imagine my shock when he introduced me to the pastor of the church. His son had repented, come in, into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and had answered God's call to ministry. You know, what is impossible with man is possible with God. But a lot of Christians think, well, it's a good thing those days are over. Truth is, in two millennium, uh, millennia of Christian history, approximately 70 million Christians have given their lives for the faith. And they weren't killed as Christians, they were killed because they were Christians. And of those 70 million, 45 and a half million, fully 65% of that total number lost their lives in the last century. In verse 17, Jesus said, everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. Now, I have to admit, I read this, I, I, I've read this passage at least 50 times over the years, but it wasn't until I was preparing the, this sermon that the, the, the obvious contradiction struck me. They will put some of you to death, but not a, head of your, a hair of your head will put, perish. Now, either Jesus was totally confused or Luke was munching on mushrooms or something else is going on here. I'm sure, pretty sure that Luke, who was a medical doctor and clearly a, a man of learning, wouldn't have recorded such an obvious error unless he had insight into what Jesus was trying to get across. The only explanation for this apparent contradiction is that Jesus had a different definition of perish than we do. 
You know, we all know the verse. You know, they hold up signs uh, on it at, at sporting events. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. To Jesus, physical death has nothing to do with perishing. Physical death is merely a change of address. Perishing is physical death without a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, what, what we're called to do as, as the children of God is align our thinking with the kingdom of God, not, not with the thinking of this perishing world. You know, when uh, in the book of John, when Mary and Martha, uh, when their brother passed away, Jesus said these words to Martha. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? You know, at a time when the world is grappling, grappling with a rising death rate due to COVID-19, I think that question is more relevant than ever. Do you believe this? You know, faith in Jesus Christ is not just a, a mental assent that he lives. It's belief that every word he, he spoke is true, and we can have absolute confidence in anchoring our lives and our eternity in those words. Now, in the next verses, Jesus shifted his prophetic warnings to the city of Jerusalem, where he was standing at the time. In verses 20 to 24, he said, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the city get out. Let those who are in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and be taken prisoner, as prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. You know, once again, I think it's debatable whether or not we can associate this warning with a single historical event. In the years between the time of, of Christ and today, foreign armies have surrounded and laid siege to Jerusalem on 10 different occasions. But once, in 70 AD, the city was completely desolated by the Roman army. And after that event, for 1,878 years, Jerusalem was occupied and governed by non-Jewish powers and the Jewish people were scattered among the nations. At the end of the Second World War in May of 1948, by way of a very contentious United Nations vote, Israel officially became a state once more. In 1967, East Jerusalem was captured from the Jordanians in the Six-Day Wars. Um, many of you seniors watched that on TV. In August of 1980, the capital city of Israel was moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem by act, an act of the Knesset parliament. That's only 40 years ago. That's a blink in the timeline of world history. But I am strongly inclined to believe that this prophecy by Jesus Christ concerning Jerusalem has been realized. Because the time of the Gentiles in Jerusalem is fulfilled. Israel has returned. Now, beginning with verse 25, Jesus shifted his prophecy from local to global. He said, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the seas. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Well, this is an interesting one because an as an amateur astronomer, I can tell you with confidence that the sun, moon, and stars have not undergone significant changes in a very, 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 very long time. Uh, now, that's not to say that we don't see new things happening all the time. We do. You know, the sun is getting a little brighter every day. The moon is spinning a little faster and moving a little farther away every day. The red giant star, uh, Betelgeuse, uh, in the upper left corner of the constellation Orion, is getting significantly dimmer right now. Um, 
But there are no distressing signs at this point. We'll have to watch for that. You know, like Donald Trump says, we'll see what happens. Um, as for nations being in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea, that's a different matter. Try to tell the residents of the island nations of the Maldives and Tuvalu that rising sea levels aren't a problem. In 80 years, their countries will be gone. They'll be uninhabitable. Uh, New York, Miami, Guangzhou, uh, Mumbai, Osaka, countless major cities are, are threatened by this problem. 30 million people in Jakarta, Indonesia are moving their capital city across the Java Sea to the island of Kalimantan because of a rise in sea level due to climate change. If that's not the definition of anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea, I don't know what is. What I'm trying to say is it's not like we're failing to see uh, the fulfillment of some of these prophecies. If this was back in the 1930s, I, I, I'd say, well, no, we've got a ways to go yet. But sitting here in 2020, looking back at the events of the last 75 years, I really think we'd be unwise not to sit up and take notice. But listen to what Jesus said next, verse 27. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. There, there's that unmistakable second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, that, that, that criterion really cuts down on the wannabes, doesn't it? You know, did you come in a cloud with power and glory? No, then sorry, David Koresh, I have bad news for you. Uh, and good news. The good news is there's still a God in heaven. The bad news is you're not him. But look at what Jesus said next, verse 28. And this is for us. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now, there's two things we need to pay attention to in this statement. Uh, first, when these things begin to take place, not once they've all come to pass and you've had time to debate them and write them up in an analytical synopsis report. Uh, no, when these things begin to take place. The second thing we need to uh, pay attention to is the, is the response Jesus is asking of us. Lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. This could be the, our moment. This could be what we're waiting for. Now, you might be thinking, now, how can you say that? We're in the middle of a global pandemic. Read the scriptures. We're supposed to be in the middle of a global pandemic. We're supposed to have wars and earthquakes and famines and pestilences. They were prophesied by Jesus Christ himself. Lift up your head. Verse 29, Jesus said, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. We are not the children of fear. We are the children of the most high God. Kingdom citizens waiting in hope for the return of our king. You know, I don't know if you've been watching Canadian news these days. Justin Trudeau makes an appearance for, on his front porch uh, every morning. And, and God bless him. You know, I, I have to admit I didn't vote for him, but I think he's doing a heck of a job. Uh, he's uniting the nation, providing relief, taking positive action, listening to, to experts around him. He keeps saying, we've got you covered. Uh, bless his heart. He's proving himself to be a good crisis prime minister. But he doesn't have us covered. God has us covered. Do you believe that? Faith always shines the brightest under pressure. And it's time to shine. Now, we're going to close by taking a very quick look at the way Jesus landed this prophecy. Uh, this was his take home. Verse 34, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, 
and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Now, I know that those of you at home who are sort of mentally checked off the first two boxes on that list, you're thinking, I've got this. I'm not carousing. Uh, I'm not into drunkenness. What about the third box? What about the anxieties of life? In a pandemic, the average person defaults to anxiety. But we're not average people. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. People, Peter said that, that we're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. We don't shut down ministry in a global crisis. We ramp it up. We use every technology and tool available to us to get on board with what God is doing in this world. And we will not be frightened. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be careless or in denial, but we're not going to be anxious. When, when Jesus Christ comes back, that day will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. There, no, there are no exemptions to the return of, of the king. But Jesus told us that things like this pandemic have to happen first. We just need to be ready. Now, Jesus ended his prophecy with these words. In verse 36, he said, Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of God. What, what great words from our Lord and King. Be always on the watch. Be alert. Be, be aware. Be living as a child of God. Be in, in tune with what God is doing in this world. Take an active part in it. Turn away from sin. Turn toward the kingdom. And pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. Not, not what might happen. This stuff is going to happen. It comes as no surprise to God. It should come as no surprise to us. We're just a little unsettled that it's come in our time. But crisis comes on every generation. We need to pray that God gives us the grace to escape the troubles of our time. And most important of all, we need to pray that we might be able to stand before the Son of Man. You know, there's a lot of talk in the world these days about preparedness or the, or the lack of it. Most nations were unprepared for this pandemic, even though there was pretty good warning signs. When it comes to Christianity, you know, there's this modern misconception that as long as you've said the magic words, you know, as long as you've recited the Jesus prayer, you've bought yourself a divine insurance policy. I don't want you to be unprepared. A disciple of Christ brings his or her life into alignment with the teachings of Christ. To follow Jesus Christ is to know him and to emulate him, to copy him, to reflect his heart to the world. If you do that, you'll be able to stand before the Son of Man without the slightest problem. Now, we're going to move into our response time now. Um, part of our, our worship response is uh, participating in, in the work of God on this earth. Um, that's not going to stop. In fact, the need for resources is going to be greater than ever. Somewhere on this screen around me is a, is a link that says donate. If you click on that, you can continue your regular giving without leaving your home. Um, or there's also a link on our church webpage. Uh, there's a blue bar about halfway down the main page with a little white heart on it. If you click on that, you can give from there as well. But wherever you are right now, um, wherever your heart is, I'm going to ask you to do something that might seem a little awkward. Uh, as our worship team uh, gets ready to lead us in a response time, would you stand up and lift up your heads? Jesus said when we see these things happening, we should do that. Because our redemption is drawing near. Now, you don't have to lift up your head through the whole worship time. I don't want you to get a crick in your neck, but let's just, let's just start our response that way. But first, let's close in prayer. Father, we, uh, we thank you for your presence uh, in the midst of our world right now. We pray for your mercy. We pray for your grace at this time. We pray for the people who are ill, uh, sick, uh, struggling with this. We pray for people who are suffering hardship, economic, um, social, 
uh, struggles at this time, Lord. Pray for our leaders, leaders of our country, leaders of our churches. We, uh, we ask that you would be with them and give them wisdom, Lord, at this time. We, we pray for our health care workers, Lord. Protect them, guide them, give them wisdom. Uh, give them the resources they need to do this job at this time. And Father, we pray that we might escape all that is about to happen. You've asked us to do that. Lord, protect your church, we pray. And Father, above all, we pray for the harvest um, that at this time, in these days, many will return to you. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our verse for today comes from Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus.
God, I just thank you that we can all come together before you, even in all the different places that we are today, God. And I thank you that we can um, just sing to you, God, and praise you as one body, no matter where we are. And I just pray as we go through this time of uncertainty, God, that we would just lean further into you and just give all our cares and stresses and worries to you, God, and just have you carry those for us. And I pray that as we go through the next few weeks, that we would just build into community, God, and build into relationships and build into um, what we have with you. And I pray all this in your name. Amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good.
benediction for this week is from Romans 8, 38-39. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God bless you church. Uh, stay safe. We'll see you next week.